Now open your question paper and look at part one. You'll hear three different extracts. For questions one to six, choose the answer A, B, or C, which fits best according to what you hear. There are two questions for each extract. Extract one. You hear two friends discussing the topic of music. Now look at questions one and two. You didn't hear me calling. Sorry, I had headphones on. I don't know how you can study to music. I mean, I like the idea of it, but I find myself listening to the words, and it really distracts me. I tried classical music once. That was really nice, but in the end, I don't think it helped me concentrate. I can't do it to music either. I'd finished studying, but I only listen to classical, so there are no words to distract me. The music demands all my attention, though. It's an art form, not something to have on in the background. Anyway, the stuff you normally listen to isn't what I'd call music. Not really. Oh yeah, I forgot you felt that way. Each to his own, I suppose. You didn't hear me calling. Sorry, I had headphones on. I don't know how you can study to music. I mean, I like the idea of it, but I find myself listening to the words, and it really distracts me. I tried classical music once. That was really nice, but in the end, I don't think it helped me concentrate. I can't do it to music either. I'd finished studying, but I only listen to classical, so there are no words to distract me. The music demands all my attention, though. It's an art form, not something to have on in the background. Anyway, the stuff you normally listen to isn't what I'd call music. Not really. Oh yeah, I forgot you felt that way. Each to his own, I suppose. Extract two. You hear part of a talk show in which two guests are talking about films. Now look at questions three and four. So, what do you look for in a movie? For me, it's the acting every time. I mean, there's something so compelling, so magical about seeing an actor take on a role and really make it his or her own. Sometimes I'm deeply engrossed in the plot, and I realise that I haven't once questioned whether or not it's real. And there are quite a few people that can do this. I'm constantly being surprised like that. They're just so utterly convincing. See, for me, it's something I take for granted. You know, the actors have one job. If they aren't convincing, then what are they doing in a film? Do you know what I mean? I'm afraid I will walk out of a film, which I've done on many occasions, if that one basic prerequisite isn't there. The thing I find spellbinding in a great film is the director's take on things. I want to experience something special, and only the director can do that for me. Of course, I recognise that the director influences the cast, but a good actor should be able to rise above bad directing. So, what do you look for in a movie? For me, it's the acting every time. I mean, there's something so compelling, so magical about seeing an actor take on a role and really make it his or her own. Sometimes I'm deeply engrossed in the plot, and I realise that I haven't once questioned whether or not it's real. And there are quite a few people that can do this. I'm constantly being surprised like that. They're just so utterly convincing. See, for me, it's something I take for granted. You know, the actors have one job. If they aren't convincing, then what are they doing in a film? Do you know what I mean? 
I'm afraid I will walk out of a film, which I've done on many occasions, if that one basic prerequisite isn't there. The thing I find spellbinding in a great film is the director's take on things. I want to experience something special, and only the director can do that for me. Of course, I recognise that the director influences the cast, but a good actor should be able to rise above bad directing. Extract 3 You hear a man and a woman talking about a picture. Now look at questions 5 and 6. Where did you get that painting? I've never seen it before. Oh, do you like it? My parents were having a clear out and they asked me if I wanted it. They've had it for years. I don't even remember it going up. It was a friend of my dad's who painted it. It's really different. Was he famous? Is it valuable? No, I don't think it's worth anything. Funnily enough, I was just talking about him with my parents. He worked in insurance with my dad. I didn't really know him, but he was talented, wasn't he? I don't think my parents ever really gave it much thought. Just had it on the wall all these years for fear of offending him. When they offered it to me, some really nice memories came flooding back. That's why I said I'd take it. I used to imagine I was walking along the side of that river. Where did you get that painting? I've never seen it before. Oh, do you like it? My parents were having a clear out and they asked me if I wanted it. They've had it for years. I don't even remember it going up. It was a friend of my dad's who painted it. It's really different. Was he famous? Is it valuable? No, I don't think it's worth anything. Funnily enough, I was just talking about him with my parents. He worked in insurance with my dad. I didn't really know him, but he was talented, wasn't he? I don't think my parents ever really gave it much thought. Just had it on the wall all these years for fear of offending him. When they offered it to me, some really nice memories came flooding back. That's why I said I'd take it. I used to imagine I was walking along the side of that river. That's the end of part one. Now turn to part two. You'll hear an environmental studies student called Margaret Lane talking about the environmental impact of the Internet. For questions 7 to 14, complete the sentences with a word or short phrase. You now have 45 seconds to look at part 2. One of the things that inspired me to research this project was that I didn't believe the internet had much of an environmental impact at all. After all, we're not burning much fuel to use it, are we? Well, there is an impact and it's quite considerable, but there is good news too. The internet cuts down or cuts out the use of paper, which is definitely good news for our trees and forests. But what about the paperless office? Fifty years ago, we were told that paper would not be needed and everyone thought that the internet would make that happen. Some said by 1990. In fact, the millions of tonnes of paper being used in homes and offices continued to rise until very recently. 
Now that figure is actually falling, although it's only by about 1% each year. Another great benefit for the planet has to be the fact that we can conduct a lot of business, even hold conferences, online. That has a real impact on our carbon footprint. Imagine how many tonnes of carbon we are not polluting the air with because we don't need to fly all over the world on business. We don't even need to drive to the bank since we can manage our finances online too. So we are burning even less fuel. Or are we? You see, something about these figures didn't add up. So I wanted to find out more. If the internet is so good for the planet, why are we still facing problems? The simple answer is that our habits have changed along with the technology. Plus, the population is increasing. So for every worker who sits at home on a computer, there are still many more who drive to work every day. Another point worth considering is that around 200 billion emails are sent every day. Now, this figure is many times greater than the number of letters sent per day, ever. Because it's cheaper to send emails, we send more of them. Around half of these emails contain spam, by the way. So what is all this costing the environment? Well, the internet is huge, so there are environmental repercussions. Starting with the raw materials needed for the hardware, we have damage caused through mining and industrial processes. Each computer or smartphone contains a number of materials that have had a cost to the environment in terms of damage to the landscape and water consumption. There is, of course, significant pollution caused by the manufacturing process. Then there's the power consumption. Very low for the individual, but multiply this by the number of phones in use and you begin to get the picture. How many computers are left on, drawing power even when you don't need it? Data centres and servers also consume electricity quite a lot of it as it turns out. I'll give you the actual figures in a minute and this places a further burden on the planet. As with the power supply, the cost of a single search is tiny but there are trillions of them and they all add up. Finally, for now, what about disposing of your old devices? What happens then? There's a major source of pollution right there. Cadmium, lead, mercury, nickel and lithium are among the highly poisonous components of modern electronic gadgets, which end up contaminating our land and water. I'd like to show you the first slide now. It contains statistical information about... Now you'll hear part two again. One of the things that inspired me to research this project was that I didn't believe the internet had much of an environmental impact at all. After all, we're not burning much fuel to use it, are we? Well, there is an impact and it's quite considerable. But there is good news too. The internet cuts down or cuts out the use of paper, which is definitely good news for our trees and forests. But what about the paperless office? Fifty years ago, we were told that paper would not be needed, and everyone thought that the internet would make that happen. Some said by 1990. In fact, the millions of tonnes of paper being used in homes and offices continued to rise until very recently. Now that figure is actually falling, although it's only by about 1% each year. Another great benefit for the planet has to be the fact that we can conduct a lot of business, even hold conferences online. 
That has a real impact on our carbon footprint. Imagine how many tonnes of carbon we are not polluting the air with because we don't need to fly all over the world on business. We don't even need to drive to the bank since we can manage our finances online too. So we are burning even less fuel. Or are we? You see, something about these figures didn't add up. So I wanted to find out more. If the internet is so good for the planet, why are we still facing problems? The simple answer is that our habits have changed along with the technology. Plus, the population is increasing. So for every worker who sits at home on a computer, there are still many more who drive to work every day. Another point worth considering is that around 200 billion emails are sent every day. Now, this figure is many times greater than the number of letters sent per day, ever. Because it's cheaper to send emails, we send more of them. Around half of these emails contain spam, by the way. So what is all this costing the environment? Well, the internet is huge, so there are environmental repercussions. Starting with the raw materials needed for the hardware, we have damage caused through mining and industrial processes. Each computer or smartphone contains a number of materials that have had a cost to the environment in terms of damage to the landscape and water consumption. There is, of course, significant pollution caused by the manufacturing process. Then there's the power consumption. Very low for the individual, but multiply this by the number of phones in use and you begin to get the picture. How many computers are left on? drawing power even when you don't need it. Data centres and servers also consume electricity, quite a lot of it as it turns out. I'll give you the actual figures in a minute, and this places a further burden on the planet. As with the power supply, the cost of a single search is tiny, but there are trillions of them and they all add up. Finally, for now, what about disposing of your old devices? What happens then? There's a major source of pollution right there. Cadmium, lead, mercury, nickel and lithium are among the highly poisonous components of modern electronic gadgets, which end up contaminating our land and water. I'd like to show you the first slide now. It contains statistical information about That's the end of part two. Now turn to part three. You will hear part of an interview with sociologist Fenya Collier and historian Ed Miles, who are both talking about the subject of telephone etiquette. For questions 15 to 20, choose the answer A, B, C or D which fits best according to what you hear. You now have 70 seconds to look at part 3.
I wonder how many of you have been annoyed by telephones, or indeed, the people using them. Fenya Collier is a sociologist who has written about, among many other things, telephone etiquette. Welcome, Fenya. Hello. And we also have Ed Miles, who is a historian. Ed's going to tell us a little about how we used to do things. Nice to have you on the programme, Ed. Nice to be here. I'd like to start with both of you, and a quick question. Do you have a pet hate when it comes to using the phone? Fenya. I do. It's rudeness. Rudeness when people are representing a business or an organisation. And it's happened to me so many times. People don't listen. They speak to you as if you're stupid. They don't explain things properly. Or they behave as if they are doing you a favour when in actual fact it's their job. They are paid to do this. Sometimes only this. They are the link between provider and customer. Infuriates me every time. I'm with you there, Fenya. But I don't have that experience too often. What I do suffer is people who... Let's say they like the sound of their own voice too much and they conduct their phone calls as if we should all hear it. Some people are showing off. Others are just inconsiderate. But I don't want to hear it, thank you. Ed, staying with you for a moment, we used to do things very differently, didn't we? We certainly did. And there's a movement towards a return to the etiquette of the past. See, if you would like these things brought back, I've narrowed it down to my top three. Firstly, I have a guide to good telephone manners from 1923, which says, let me find it, Do not let any other activity interfere with your call. Give the other person your full attention. Make sure your message is clear. And avoid all distractions for fear of giving the impression that you are ignoring them. Then there's this one. Calls should not be made before 9am or after 9pm, except in an emergency. The third one says we should avoid using the telephone at all if it's to deliver bad news or issue an invitation. Fenya, how would you feel about a return to these rules of etiquette? I definitely agree with the third point. We are social beings and we have become very isolated by modern life. I imagine someone getting bad news over the phone and perhaps they live on their own. Once they put down that phone, I can't think of a worse situation. So much better to have someone there in person who can comfort you, talk to you, and find someone to spend time with you in a situation like that. Personally, I'd also love to see the return of written invitations, like handwritten thank you letters, but I'm afraid that's not going to happen except for very formal events. People don't write letters anymore, and it's sad. How about giving the other person your full attention? Well, it's plain good manners, isn't it? I mean, if you're asking me if I've ever had an hour-long conversation while I've been doing household chores, then I'm afraid I'm guilty as charged, but only with close friends or family members. And I hate it when people conduct a conversation with somebody else in the room while they're talking to me on the phone, so I avoid that. How about the time thing? Do you make calls after nine o'clock in the evening? Of course I do. And there's nothing really wrong with that, as long as you've cleared it up beforehand. I remember making a phone call to a friend when I was at my grandparents' house, and my grandmother saying, isn't it a bit late to be calling them? And what time was it? I think it was about ten in the evening. So, in other words, they wouldn't do it, and they wouldn't expect others to phone them at that time. Which backs up what I was saying. It depends who you're phoning. You need to respect the other person. I think with older people, they can panic a little when they get an unexpected phone call, so it's better to try to fit it in with their expectations. But some young people phone friends at midnight all the time. We just need to teach them that it's not acceptable to do it to everyone. Ed, you chose your top three. Does that mean you'd like to see them being used today? Well... I know we like to laugh at some of the things that were considered good etiquette in the past, and some of them really should stay in the past. But there is a danger that we are forgetting our manners, and I agree with Fenya's views. I think people who have never been taught things like this could benefit from a few guidelines. I mean, 
How would young people know not to phone certain people after 9pm if nobody told them? Well, we're going to have to take a short break, but we'll be right back after. Now you'll hear part three again. I wonder how many of you have been annoyed by telephones, or indeed, the people using them. Fenya Collier is a sociologist who has written about, among many other things, telephone etiquette. Welcome, Fenya. Hello. And we also have Ed Miles, who is a historian. Ed's going to tell us a little about how we used to do things. Nice to have you on the program, Ed. Nice to be here. I'd like to start with both of you, and a quick question. Do you have a pet hate when it comes to using the phone? Fenya. I do. It's rudeness. Rudeness when people are representing a business or an organisation. And it's happened to me so many times. People don't listen. They speak to you as if you're stupid. They don't explain things properly. Or they behave as if they are doing you a favour when in actual fact it's their job. They are paid to do this, sometimes only this. They are the link between provider and customer. Infuriates me every time. I'm with you there, Fenya, but I don't have that experience too often. What I do suffer is people who, let's say they like the sound of their own voice too much, and they conduct their phone calls as if we should all hear it. Some people are showing off. Others are just inconsiderate. But I don't want to hear it, thank you. Ed, staying with you for a moment, we used to do things very differently, didn't we? We certainly did. And there's a movement towards a return to the etiquette of the past. See, if you would like these things brought back, I've narrowed it down to my top three. Firstly, I have a guide to good telephone manners from 1923, which says, let me find it, do not let any other activity interfere with your call. Give the other person your full attention. Make sure your message is clear. And avoid all distractions for fear of giving the impression that you are ignoring them. Then there's this one. Calls should not be made before 9am or after 9pm except in an emergency. The third one says we should avoid using the telephone at all if it's to deliver bad news or issue an invitation. Fenya, how would you feel about a return to these rules of etiquette? I definitely agree with the third point. We are social beings and we have become very isolated by modern life. I imagine someone getting bad news over the phone and perhaps they live on their own. Once they put down that phone, I can't think of a worse situation. So much better to have someone there in person who can comfort you, talk to you and find someone to spend time with you in a situation like that. Personally, I'd also love to see the return of written invitations, like handwritten thank you letters, but I'm afraid that's not going to happen except for very formal events. People don't write letters anymore and it's sad. How about giving the other person your full attention? Well, it's plain good manners, isn't it? I mean, if you're asking me if I've ever had an hour-long conversation while I've been doing household chores, then I'm afraid I'm guilty as charged, but only with close friends or family members. And I hate it when people conduct a conversation with somebody else in the room while they're talking to me on the phone, so I avoid that. How about the time thing? Do you make calls after nine o'clock in the evening? Of course I do, and there's nothing really wrong with that, as long as you've cleared it up beforehand. I remember making a phone call to a friend when I was at my grandparents' house, and my grandmother saying, isn't it a bit late to be calling them? And what time was it? I think it was about ten in the evening. So, in other words, they wouldn't do it, and they wouldn't expect others to phone them at that time, which backs up what I was saying. It depends who you're phoning. You need to respect the other person. I think with older people, they can panic a little when they get an unexpected phone call, so it's better to try to fit it in with their expectations. But some young people phone friends at midnight all the time. We just need to teach them that it's not acceptable to do it to everyone. Ed, you chose your top three. 
Does that mean you'd like to see them being used today? Well, I know we like to laugh at some of the things that were considered good etiquette in the past, and some of them really should stay in the past. But there is a danger that we are forgetting our manners, and I agree with Fenya's views. I think people who have never been taught things like this could benefit from a few guidelines. I mean, how would young people know not to phone certain people after 9 pm if nobody told them? Well, we're going to have to take a short break, but we'll be right back after. That's the end of part three. Now turn to part four. Part four consists of two tasks. You will hear five short extracts in which people are talking about taking photographs. Look at task one. For questions 21 to 25, choose from the list A to H the main reason each speaker gives for taking pictures. Now look at task 2. For questions 26 to 30, choose from the list A to H what each speaker says they would like to be able to do. You now have 45 seconds to look at part 4. Speaker 1 There's one subject I take more photos of than anything else, and that's my children. I do have a couple of prints on the wall by a professional photographer, but I photograph them every chance I get. They grow so fast and, well, you forget, don't you? The trouble is, I can never find pictures when I'm looking for them, and that's because I never really had a system for storing them. They just go straight on the computer. I'm sure they're safe, but I have duplicates and folders all over the place, and of course, nothing is labelled. Sometimes it would be nice to be able to look for a particular picture and be able to find it. Speaker 2 I suppose everyone's a photographer nowadays because if you've got a phone in your pocket, you've usually got a camera too, haven't you? Well, that's what I use, and it's fine for the job, but if I'm honest, I rarely take pictures unless I'm on holiday or somewhere new and I want to have something to remind me of where I was. I wish my pictures weren't quite so boring, but they are just that. You wouldn't want them on your wall. I think if I spent a bit more time thinking about composing the shot, that would help. I've read articles about it, and there are some very simple rules you can follow. I'm planning to put some of those into practice. Speaker 3 Photography is my hobby, and I look forward to every outing with my camera. It's quite old now, and sometimes I find it a bit limiting, but until I can afford something more professional, I'll have to manage with what I've got. I love to try different things, and I'm forever looking for a new angle, a different composition, or a different setting to take a shot with. I'm quite methodical about it, and I read a lot of articles online. Then I see an effect I like, and I set out to try to achieve it. I often revisit places that I like and try to take completely different pictures of the same scene. My pictures are very personal to me, and for the time being they're not for public display. I don't think I'll ever be a professional photographer myself, but I admire the work of others. Speaker 4 I've taken photos since before the age of 10 and my main passion is photographing people. I started with relatives, then friends, but it's now become a burning desire for me to be able to make a living out of portraiture. 
so I'm working very hard at that and attending an evening class. I always prefer to use natural light, and I'm really over the moon with what I can do there. But there are times when complex flash photography is called for, and I'm going to have to branch out a little and get more experience in that. I have all this stuff here, but I'm not making the most of it. Speaker 5 I never print any of my pictures because I don't think they're really good enough for that. But I post a lot of my work in the various photography groups I'm in. You just mentioned that you're keen to receive constructive criticism and people are very encouraging and generous with their knowledge. They point out things that you haven't noticed yourself, like the horizon's not straight or it's too dark. It's a fast way to learn, and already I've posted a couple that people have said they wouldn't change in any way. When I can do that every time, I'll know I've achieved my aim. There are lots of competitions too, but I haven't plucked up the courage to submit anything yet. Now you'll hear part four again. Speaker one. There's one subject I take more photos of than anything else, and that's my children. I do have a couple of prints on the wall by a professional photographer, but I photograph them every chance I get. They grow so fast and, well, you forget, don't you? The trouble is, I can never find pictures when I'm looking for them, and that's because I never really had a system for storing them. They just go straight on the computer. I'm sure they're safe, but I have duplicates and folders all over the place, and of course, nothing is labelled. Sometimes it would be nice to be able to look for a particular picture and be able to find it. Speaker 2 I suppose everyone's a photographer nowadays because if you've got a phone in your pocket, you've usually got a camera too, haven't you? Well, that's what I use, and it's fine for the job, but if I'm honest, I rarely take pictures unless I'm on holiday or somewhere new and I want to have something to remind me of where I was. I wish my pictures weren't quite so boring, but they are just that. You wouldn't want them on your wall. I think if I spent a bit more time thinking about composing the shot, that would help. I've read articles about it, and there are some very simple rules you can follow. I'm planning to put some of those into practice. Speaker 3 Photography is my hobby, and I look forward to every outing with my camera. It's quite old now, and sometimes I find it a bit limiting, but until I can afford something more professional, I'll have to manage with what I've got. I love to try different things, and I'm forever looking for a new angle, a different composition, or a different setting to take a shot with. I'm quite methodical about it, and I read a lot of articles online. Then I see an effect I like, and I set out to try to achieve it. I often revisit places that I like and try to take completely different pictures of the same scene. My pictures are very personal to me, and for the time being they're not for public display. I don't think I'll ever be a professional photographer myself, but I admire the work of others. Speaker 4 I've taken photos since before the age of 10 and my main passion is photographing people. I started with relatives, then friends, but it's now become a burning desire for me to be able to make a living out of portraiture. So I'm working very hard at that and attending an evening class. I always prefer to use natural light, and I'm really over the moon with what I can do there. But there are times when complex flash photography is called for, and I'm going to have to branch out a little and get more experience in that. I have all this stuff here, but I'm not making the most of it. Speaker 5 I never print any of my pictures because I don't think they're really good enough for that. But I post a lot of my work in the various photography groups I'm in. 
You just mentioned that you're keen to receive constructive criticism and people are very encouraging and generous with their knowledge. They point out things that you haven't noticed yourself, like the horizon's not straight or it's too dark. It's a fast way to learn and already I've posted a couple that people have said they wouldn't change in any way. When I can do that every time, I'll know I've achieved my aim. There are lots of competitions too, but I haven't plucked up the courage to submit anything yet. That's the end of part four.